Business Security Weekly is recorded on Mondays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Each week, we address the challenges facing CISOs through our guest interviews, including former and active CISOs. Our news segment is focused on leadership and communication to better help security leaders translate and communicate security risks into business risks. Jason Albuquerque, Ben Carr, Tyler Robinson, and others add their expertise to the conversation. I'm Matt Alderman, and I hope you search for Business Security Weekly in your favorite podcast catcher and subscribe to download our latest content. Welcome back, everyone, to Paul's Security Weekly. Register for an official cybersecurity summit at securityweekly.com forward slash cybersecurity summit using the code SECWEEK23 to get $100 off admission. Also, if you want links to all of my social media, podcast gear recommendations, <clears throat> a list of podcasts I listen to, technical how-to blog posts, and links to my upcoming and previous presentations, which is recently updated, you can visit my website at securitypodcaster.com. And yes, I will be adding some Flipper Zero stuff. <clears throat> my social media followers know I've been posting about all the... I've been buying some trinkets. I've been like out of control I mean, check out this antenna. This is uh, dot slash Kevin Finisterre's recommendation. This is all it takes for Paul to go spend money online. He's like, dude, this is uh, a sub gigahertz antenna for the Flipper Zero. It comes out of uh, Euro Design out of uh, Germany. Now, I almost don't want to say some of the stuff on the show because then people are going to go order it and then order is going to be put on hold because they're going to be busy like making all of these. Uh, there's actually a newer version than the one I bought uh that works with the silicone uh case oh boy this one does not so i have to take the the silicone case off but i have been at least 50 feet away and been able to pop the charging port on my tesla i'm working on to like see just how far away i can be mm. to transmit with this. this the antenna is extra it's a massive uh antenna but it is for sub gigahertz uh transmission so that it greatly extends your range. Also, all seven TVs here in the studio, I was turning them on and off with my little IR blaster uh, from Rabbit Labs. Uh, awesome, awesome stuff. Also, give your wife a heads up if she checks the credit card bill and <laughs> sees a charge from Tindy. Like Tindy is not like Tinder or, or like, it's not a dating website. It's where you buy geeky electronic stuff. I had to I had Which pretty much eliminates you. your ever needing a dating one this is true this is true this is true i'm like no i was ordering stuff I'm like did you see my really cool new uh, sp32 with it has a camera on it like i got i got one of those and she's like wow i'm really married to a, a nerd uh -huh. okay <laughs> yes so i am going to put some stuff on my website about about a series of of things also i understand there's way better tools than what comes on the flipper zero and many of you have pointed that out and rightfully so i agree uh so i hope to start covering those tools now this is going to be a very expensive hobby mm -hmm. <laughs> at the end mm -hmm. uh, for paul but i'm totally getting into uh a lot of this gear productive so hobby though it's a productive hobby if used correctly if used yes responsibly there, there could be a lot of shenanigans so like don't like, pl please don't, and because I will probably talk about this at some point, but you can go into a retail store, such as Lowe's, and with the right sub gigahertz files, um, which I have on one or both of my, of my Flipper Zeros, you can transmit on the frequency with the right payload to trigger the customer assistance. Uh, you know, when you go in the aisle, like if you're in electrical, you, you might get a call from Lowe's Cisco yeah, at the end of this, probably. And then, so you push the button, and then it comes with a loudspeaker. Customer assistance needed in electrical. Ding. <laughs> Customer assistance needed in electrical. I was like, I found the database files. I load them on my flipper, and I'm like, no way. And I'm going into the Lowe's, and I, so I take my flipper zero with my voice like. What are you doing with that? You're just running in to get like a thing to fix a cord on one of the, you know, saws in the garage. I'm like, I just, I got to try something. I'm like, <laughs> if you see the cops pull up, I'm like, just, you know, go run away. <laughs> I was going to say, it's we'll fine. be live from federal interest. prison next week. Yeah, it's fine. Right. But I was in electrical. Now, I could have made all of them go off in all of the different departments because okay. I had all the different departments. That was my next my question. Yeah. So Don't was do it that. location based and yeah. was it correct? Like, did it go to the correct and how? Yeah. So I think it's just a 
wireless transmission on it could even be the same frequency with just a different payload is my guess so like when you're in electrical and you push the button it transmits on a wireless frequency that sends a message to the ultimately connected to the pager system right that goes someone pushed the button in in electrical and needs assistance if you're in flooring that button maybe just has a different code that it transmit and it goes oh someone pushed the button in flooring however if you have a flipper zero you can transmit all of those messages as long as you go in and, and push them and transmit those individual files you could even oh god i don't even want to know if i want to say that i'm going to say this but i'm going to preface this with don't do this like don't do this yes it's possible and i'm not telling you anything you can't find on the internet you can create a sub gigahertz playlist which is basically exactly as it sounds go play all of these files to transmit on this frequency all these different um payloads in succession so you could create a playlist that if you walked into Lowe's, okay. triggered every single different customer uh, assistance button in every single aisle and create chaos in the store. The only thing that would do is piss off customers and people that work at Lowe's. It would just so cause like, chaos. Don't, yeah, like don't, don't, that's just, don't, there's they don't no, need that. Yeah. But I walked into Lowe's and I was like, I got to see if this works. Oh, now, God. I was in electrical. <laughs> don't okay? do this, but. I legit, and I legit had a question. Now, the button was in the next aisle over, but I was in the electrical aisle, uh, the, but not the one with the button. You know, there's like multiple mm -hmm. electrical aisles. And I was like, <clears throat> I do kind of need help finding the, like, mm. I just need to replace a, the end on a, like the, the plug got damaged for the miter saw and damaged like the, one of the prongs broke off, mm. right? And I'm like, I swear they make, I know they make something too. I actually YouTubed it. I'm like, oh, they make something that I can replace it. All I got to do is put two wires in the thing and screw them down and I got a new yep. thing. I'm like, I, that's totally doable. Um, but I'm like, I don't know where these things, where these things are because I've never actually had to buy one before. And so I'm in the electrical <laughs> and it's like instantaneous. I push the button and it goes, customer assistance needed in electrical and my son just looks at me my oldest with me it's like i'm walking away i'm doing chopping it in another, uh -huh. in another aisle <laughs> your, your kids have learned good techniques yes, yes. like get far away from dad get far away from dad when he's, he's got the like, flipper and lows or your kids just drop to their knees and put their hands behind their heads and go yeah okay don't kill <laughs> me don't tase me bro <clears throat> i hear it works in cvs too oh boy <laughs> okay, that's why we couldn't get our medications the other day. I was like, this rash isn't going to go away on its own. No. And they're like, sorry, our whole customer service system is wrecked. You know why CVS has them? It, it, this is part theory, but it's because of meth heads. Oh. Because mm. you can't. Yeah. So I don't know how well known this fact is, and I don't know why. I oh, God. Here, I don't do this at home. No, but like <laughs> it, Imodium that you take if you have diarrhea, if you ever take an Imodium. Imodium is one they've separated the chemical component from opium that causes constipation. I heard this on a podcast. And I think huh. it was Joe Rogan was interviewing uh, Dr. Carl Hart, and he said it on the, the Rogan podcast. I'm like, I never, I never knew that. I'm like, that's fascinating. I'm like, oh, that's why you can't buy Imodium in a, a jar that just has all the loose pills in it. They come in the blister packs. And certain stores, not all of them, but CVS for whatever reason, has, you have to push the customer assistance button and someone has to come over with a key and hand you like one package mm -hmm. of Imodium. I'm like, seriously? I'm like, people are buying this because they have diarrhea. Like you're literally getting in the way of someone who has diarrhea. Like, come on now. <laughs> it's terrible. Uh, but I, it's, yeah. Yeah, that's a long Bob, wait. Yeah. Bob told me it works in CVS too. Interesting. <laughs> But don't do that. But don't do that. Don't. Yeah, no. Don't. Yeah. Don't, don't do that. Do that. Only hack if you have permission. Mm -hmm. Don't. Don't cook a modium <laughs> down. And don't do that either. <laughs> well, it's the don't same thing with Sudafed. That makes me think though about like um, <clears throat> bell systems in schools. Oh God. Oh no. Yeah, don't do that. That seems don't. like to be complete <laughs> havoc. Yeah, they probably have some of those same systems in schools for announcements probably. too. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah so, but yeah. they're probably yeah, not they're unless probably it's a new school. Honestly. Yeah, but unless it's a new school, which is pretty rare. Yeah, uh, we yes. don't, there's, there's well, no in, yeah. Rhode, Island, in yeah, Rhode, Island, Rhode Island, it's rare. Yeah, like Florida yeah. and other places, they oh, put okay. up schools like a million yeah times a year. But the schools right. here are like. Still using the system for the March to war. Yeah, I am. That's true. I am used to West Coast and like. 
new schools right that are like citadel in themselves but have we don't a lot have of those here no we, we, no, we, have, the, we have, have ancient, simplified we have, um, we, we have the ones where it's like hampton <laughs> they're, middle they're, school the old asbestos factory is now being used for <laughs> yes and, and there's probably like a ton of copper they runs oh, to totally. every single room to make yeah, the, the bells I'm, ring I'm yes so. it's, it's, got, a, a lot of schools have world war ii shelters inside of them yeah 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 it's, fallout it's shelter there. Mm-hmm. Oh. Too. And they have this old clock systems where you have to go in and hand crank it and it only goes forward. So when yes. they have to adjust the clock every three days so that it mm-hmm. stays current, you know, they have to crank the thing. And yeah. So anyway, <laughs> how do we get anyway? This episode called Don't Do This at Home. Called Don't Do This at Home. Or you don't will go to jail. Do we have any Don't Do This at Home kind of, kind of stories? Uh, <laughs> well, we, have a, we have a ThinkPad. Well, we got a couple of cool like uh, hardware things. Uh, this is. The article is titled The ThinkPad You All Wish You Had with a Brain That's Not Ancient. And this is my, it's alive. Like they totally created a Frankenstein laptop. So it's an iPad screen with a framework motherboard and a custom case to hold a ThinkPad uh, keyboard. So, wow. That is some. That's a Frankenpad. <laughs> it's a Frankenpad. Yep. And apparently they're going to publish the, uh, so the design files will eventually be put online should anyone else want to try. Yeah, so we've taken the display panel from an iPad and made it work with a framework board and designed an entirely new lower case for the ThinkPad. It'll hold the framework board with USB ports, USB-C ports at the edge. Um, he made a custom external port replicator. Um, yeah, and there's a YouTube wow. video. I guess if you really like the ThinkPad, ThinkPad keyboard, rather, this is a project for you. Or not. <laughs> or you could just buy a framework. I mean, yeah, I'm, just I'm kind of at that, like, yeah, maybe just buy the buy framework. The framework. That's, I, li- the I love my framework. I got a framework right in front of me right now. I like, uh, we don't, I like it, too. Sponsor. We're not sponsored by them. Uh, well, also, when the cops come, I'm going to I'm gonna take that and say it was mine. So. I don't blame you. It doesn't belong to Paul. That was mine. I brought it in. <laughs> Joe Grand uh, did a project on the the thinnest boombox. This is a really, I mean, it's Joe Grand, so of course it's a really cool uh, project. It's a Raspberry Pi Zero Two W that runs Moppity to provide the music server functionality and some speakers, all in like a giant PCB. And he had someone like do artwork on it. It's really cool. I linked to the Hackaday article, and there's two YouTube videos on it. I just thought it was really cool. I mean, I think everything Joe does is really super cool. Uh, and he's had some cool projects uh, in this, I believe, is his latest uh, project. Other hardware news, Raspberry Pi Pico will intelligently warm your butt. I don't know that I want something that I program myself and solder myself that goes underneath my butt warming me. <laughs> if I mess something up, totally, I guess it wouldn't, it can't be that much Mix that with a little emodium and a flipper, and you that's got a party. <laughs> that's why I love having the show, Doug. The imagination is always <laughs> greatly appreciated. So I don't know, that's my, kind of my hardware <laughs> projects. The, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to do, do I'm, I'm not going to do the butt warmer. I'm just saying I'm, I'm not. Well, you, you also sorry. had one about a smuggler who had 306 oh my CPUs God, stuffed in a girdle. This, and they caught him because he was walking funny in the airport. Yeah. Because he had a girl with 306 <laughs> CPUs on them. Yeah. They believe they were Ryzen, Ryzen Pros or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I read that. Yeah. Um, by one of the pictures, they could see one of the CPUs or a bunch of the CPUs, and they zoomed in on one and recognized some of the markings and said it's likely. They weren't 100% sure, but they said it's likely a Ryzen, Ryzen Pro or something. He's just lucky they don't have pins on them anymore. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, they do have pins, do they? No, they're, 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 they just have. Connect- oh, they, they have, have uh, now. They have the connectors. Yeah. So I you don't get the old days, like you know, that was like I was saying in my intro when I was talking about bending pins yes. on an 8088. See, I, in my brain, I still think CPUs have have. I still install them like they have pins. Oh yeah, because you're like, <laughs> hey, oh god, oh god, I'm scarred for life from, from pins like slowly. Uh, yeah, but you're right. They're just they're just pads, right? My best pin story was a guy had bought a a, a new 386 processor and. He called me and said, could you come take a look at this? I paid a lot of money for it, and it won't work. And I went and looked at it, and all the pins on the bottom were just squished. Oh. And I was like, what happened here? And he was like, well, it wouldn't go in, so I hit it with a rubber mallet. I didn't think that would hurt it. <laughs> and I was like, you did that what? That would hurt it. 
He was like, can you straighten all those pins? And I was like, if you pay me by the hour, maybe. Because yeah. <laughs> we used to do that with sewing needles. You know, you put like a needle up through that and lift it up, and it would actually, yeah. of course, you know, half the time one would break off or something. And then, and then you're totally you screwed. With, yeah, then yeah. it's just like throw it in the trash and say, kiss that $3,000. Unless you want to be soldering one of the, no, you don't want to. You couldn't it. solder no, that back. I don't think, I, maybe I, Joe Grant might not even be able to solder the great, that back. Yeah, Lou yeah. was the greatest solderer I ever knew, and he, and he, he couldn't, couldn't have soldered yeah. that back. Yeah, and it's, and it's not solder anyway. I don't even know what There's some people with some soldering skills, man. Oh, no. Lou was, man. First thing he ever made me solder was I had to make a cube out of uh, paper clips. Ooh. Yeah, you had to solder all the chunks together to make a nice cube, and it had to be conductive. Mm. That's a challenge. And he had to do that after a lot of drinks. That was his, like, if you want to be friends with me, you got to do this kind oh, of thing? Oh, yeah. He's like, <laughs> he's like don't, don't call yourself a solderer until <laughs> you can make one of these, and it still works after a bunch of drinks. That's awesome. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, where do you want to go next? Excuse me. Where are we going next? Well, we've done the 2D boom box, so... Uh, we've done we've done that. We want to go to... We've done the smuggler. I mean, we covered the smuggler. There's not much to know about the smuggler, Doug, other than <laughs> what we've talked about already. Well, I, that, Those were really the highlights. Well, one, one of your stories that I, I like a lot, or I don't like it, I'm scared of it, but was, uh, was your story 17 about connected medical devices and how those are going to be the next ransomware targets because you're seeing more and more people. And I, I had a meeting a long, long time ago with a company. I, I, can't, I can't say the name of it, but they make medical devices. And they were just then talking about creating enabled um monitors for insulin pumps mm -hmm. that you would actually have implanted in your body and they wanted to talk about the security concerns that might arise from this and i was looking at some of the code and i was going oh my god and i mean this is terrifying to me because you are seeing now more and more people are getting insulin pumps more and more people are getting monitoring systems that they wear and all this stuff starts to become rather terrifying. Uh, you know, I've seen people with heart monitors they've been told to wear for three days at home so that mm -hmm. it connects to Wi-Fi. And, I, I mean, I really see this becoming a, a giant issue. And I know Klopp says they won't uh, ransomware, stuff like that, but, uh, you know. Well, they say it. But <laughs> so the, <clears throat> the author says it's not hard to imagine the magnitude of impact if malicious actors obtain control over medical systems and remove them from operation at a hospital with hundreds of beds. Now, I've heard this before. I think the key point in there is it's not hard to imagine. And largely, that's what we've had to do on this particular subject is imagine. Because they're, while I don't want people to get hurt, certainly not, especially yeah. someone who's already sick, um, I mean, which is really like the main mm -hmm. reason why you would have a device or be hooked up to a device because you're already sick or you, they think you're sick, right? You think you're sick. So I, I don't want anyone to get hurt, especially someone who's already sick. But I feel like it's going to take that before we really see reform. Now, we're starting to see good reform in this area. This is a very promising area where we're starting to see reform. FDA, for example, right, not going to approve devices that have... Right. known cybersecurity issues, uh, and there's a process for that. I'm greatly, grossly oversimplifying that, but that's basically the gist of it. Um, so we see good inroads, but I think before manufacturers, hospitals, developers, software developers, not developers themselves, but companies that make software for the, for the devices uh, and IT departments really, truly either are serious about it or they're really, truly forced to be serious about it People are going to have to get hurt. Yeah. Uh, and that's, mm -hmm. that's that cost, human nature. That's the cost needle. Yeah. You know, I mean, as long as people are just speculating about things, even if it's, if it's not really speculation, if it's like, look at this code. This code is compromisable in a dozen different ways. It will be compromised. You're not going to get a response when they go, what will that cost to replace that code? And the company's going, well, it'll take years of development, and we have to go to the FDA process again and whatever. And until you start seeing chaos, you just don't see response. And I mean, the same thing with, ran with general ransomware. Well, ransom well ransomware is um, an activity, <laughs> right? Not necessarily an attack yeah. or even a, a threat. It's a inactivity that threat actors use. It's a process and behavior of threat actors. <clears throat> and so we are all concerned about ransomware, right? And adopt solutions processes we spend money 
to solve the ransomware But we problem. didn't. I mean, but ransomware is really just an activity. How, but right? how many years were we telling people to make out-of-band backups and to take mm. these actions? And they were like, yeah, 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 we'll get to that next week. We'll put that on the list of yeah, possibilities. that's where I was going. And you then when they going. got ransomware all of a sudden the CEO's calling you back going, remember that thing you were, I mean, I had this happen. People call me going, remember that thing you were talking about like five years ago? Could you come back down here and talk yes. about that again? <laughs> and he was like, why? And they're like, well, we had a little incident. We just want to, you know, run it past you. We get the NDA signed and we can talk. And, and you know, you go down there and you're going, okay, so what happened? And they're like, well, here's what happened. Every hard drive in the company is encrypted right now. <laughs> and you weren't you talking about how to beat that? And I'm like, yeah, you, you need out of band backups. And they're like, can you do that after the fact? <laughs> that really happened. Well, yeah. If you you pay the <laughs> ransom and we get the decryption key, then yeah, I, I was like, do you, that? Need to pay, yeah. you need to pay the ransom. I'm like, I'm sorry, you can't put the you can't put the chicken back in the barn or whatever the hell. The <laughs> whatever. The, you, yes. you didn't take my advice five years ago. No, it's you know, like, it's just it's like, like, like yeah, yeah, sure, we'll put that on the list of things we ought to do someday. But you know, now you want to make backups out of band after your ransomware, and I'm like, yeah, you can make copies of that. It won't do you any good, but you can do it. Right. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I saw that thing about the medical device, and I've been thinking about that for a while now. Because that that literally that meeting I had was years ago, and they were just starting to think about that with the with these products, and they were thinking, is this an issue? Do you think people would hack this? Hackers wouldn't go after sick people, would they? I'm like, no, nah, no way. This is the reason they're you know they're not probably not good people. If they're nobody hacking. nobody would like ruin the customer service system at CVS, right? I mean, who knows? Who would happen. do that? <laughs> but I think um, a loss of life event garners a lot of attention oh it does oh, yeah. totally there was a i think this person did lose their life in the uk when there was a ransomware attack and they had to be diverted to a hospital i mean th th that is i think like a dominant theme that that's going to come up over the next five years it's just like critical infrastructure in general yeah and i i don't think people talk about medical the fact that medical mm -hmm. i would you know I think a lot more falls under critical infrastructure than like people actually yeah. consider. It's not just power grids, right? Like it's utilities. It's like everything from, you know, the supply chain of how do we get our water to, you know, how do we keep sick people safe? Yeah. But now people are talking about it. One of those people is Josh Corman. And I did an interview sure. with Josh and it hasn't aired yet. Not but, enough people. You know what I yeah. mean? There's not enough money going towards it. There's not enough air time on also, it. Also, I think we should air that, that interview. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. Probably. Be good. Yeah. We talked at length about this particular issue, including that woman did, did unfortunately lose her life because of a, a ransomware. Yeah, attack, it really which, sucks if that's Which is you, interesting yeah. that it, just in that one instance, and I feel really bad for that woman and her family, but uh, just that one incident garnered a lot of attention and a lot of people talking about it well people so like, don't let's do something before it happens again totally yeah when when you know i mean i think especially for like politicians for you know whatever just stakeholders in general executives that are pretty detached from so you know the co you know the, the people making decisions until they see someone oh like people can die from this yeah it's because but it's, it's understandable a, uh, <coughs> because it is but it's not the fix isn't understandable no 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 but right? neither it, is the problem the, the, yeah yeah people. the problem in the fix is kind of there's a multi-layered approach to like yes you should have good backups but also you should have fail safes in a healthcare facility there's no one you, you can't just hand someone you know a one pager and be like this is how you fix it but that's how they fix wrong side surgery right mm -hmm. they said oh now before anyone has surgery they do what's called a timeout and they fixed it with a process. Everyone takes a timeout. Everyone reads everything back to everyone. They double check it, say, yes, we're amputating this person's left leg. Does everyone agree that this is the patient, this is their date of birth, and we're amputating the, the left leg? So they added a whole bunch of process that has to be done before every procedure. And this may not be in every single hospital, but I bet you it's pretty similar. It is. In, in most hospitals, if not all hospitals today, that this procedure is done. But we because don't necessarily was... have that with s computer systems Correct. everywhere, That's, right? It's not you like... You smell what I've been stepping in. Exactly, yes. right? Yes. It's like, I bet you actually at a lot of hospitals, they don't have that. Right, you know, because the fix, department. the fix is just not, oh, we just, we implement this one process no. and we make everyone do this one process and then we don't have to worry about the ransomware threat anymore. That's not true because right. the threat is dynamic. Well, there's also the, like, the, the threat vectors are way larger yeah, than like, just course. like one thing. Right. Right, 
with wrong side surgery, it's like basically one thing, right? That they could they could target an attack with a process, mm -hmm. and thankfully they did. And I think it largely has reduced the number of wrong side surgeries because that was costing. Back to your point, Doug, hospitals <clears throat> across the board haunt billions of dollars, likely in, in legal fees. Yeah, I mean, I, I yeah. did I did one of those cases. In fact, right. when I when I had surgery on my knee. I, I remembered my case, and bef the night before I was supposed to go to surgery, I took a Sharpie and wrote, this is the leg <laughs> and I, on, on that leg, and I wrote, not this leg on the other one. And when I got there, and they, you know, they were like, look at me like, oh, who did this? Was, did you see something? I was like, no, I did that last night. I was yes. like, I did a case about this. Of course, you don't want to tell them that you were ever involved in that. No, kind of stuff. no. They're like, oh, you need to leave now. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. <laughs> Uh, how about the network discoverability stuff? The no knock networking uh, hacker factor blog. Did you did you read did you read these? I did actually. I had read those uh, earlier, and they're they're quite quite interesting. I mean, basically, they're saying something I think we we all kind of know, which is that it, there's this sort of obvious solution about getting rid of ICMP. You know, I mean, that's that's been something mm -hmm. we've talked about forever, and. Was that really the focus, though, or was that just like one example he was That's using? just an example yeah, yeah. of, of okay. uh, I, I guess the point is that, that really many, many, many different vectors exist for discoverability, they, in, especially in the modern age, where, where not only do devices talk to each other, but they have their own open protocols, Cisco discovery protocols, and all these kind of things. And anybody with even just a little bit of knowledge can actually develop tools to fully explore networks without very much permission i agree i think there's a lot of ways to hide on the internet was kind of my point at the, at the top of the show was uh what i was trying to allude to was yeah you can turn a bunch of stuff off but there's so many different ways to discover systems i mean and i think largely it's been pen testers have known about the stuff for a long time but bug bounty hunters really is their first stage in the bug bounty hunt they're doing this intelligence gathering to mm -hmm. find targets. Yep. And there's a monetary incentive, which I think is absolutely right. Yeah. When we talk about bug bounties, that they are financially motivated to be able to find all the systems to find the bugs. That means that, you know, finding something could be uh, a finding in and of itself, right? I also think organizations need to do a better job of finding all their stuff, but hiding this stuff is going to be... Now, I agree there's things you can do to make it harder to find stuff, and there's that and if that is not a low cost to you as a defender you should absolutely do that right like we just need to talk about the economics behind all of this and it's all what, about incentives yeah what's the incentive to do that and i mean just turning off icmp is not going to help all that much with it does help a little with discoverability but not a lot i mean you've got certificate ca trust chains you've got <laughs> there's a whole industry there, called there's, tax there's service a lot management. of there you know, the, 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 tax you, service management companies some of them have done a really good job of scouring the internet because it's not just physically finding something. Like they'll go look at your logo and then they'll do, um, they'll build their own image search capability because there's tools out there that can be like, where is this image used mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, the better companies will build their own intelligence uh, gathering of images, right? Because yeah. I'm like, oh, like you're just using tin eye. And they're like, no, no, no. We built a way better tin eye for this purpose because, again, there's an incentive. Yeah. Where is my logo being used? Could be who's setting up phishing websites mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and trying to, to spoof my company, spoof the identity yeah. of the company. And all that is part of your attack surface. Mm -hmm. And I, I think small business, it's tough, although I'm starting to see some offerings in the smaller business aspect there's one that like if you're an individual with maybe you've got a few domains and a few email addresses you plug it all into the site 50 bucks a month to monitor it for you in the very mm -hmm. same way um that's cool yeah so, so i mean I, so there I like is a that. kind of trickle down because yeah. you know traditionally almost every solution that we looked at when we were talking to small and medium-sized businesses you know it was just not feasible yeah, I mean, I mean, the salesperson comes and gives you this whole pitch, and they hand out the free hats and the free T-shirts, and then the company's going, "Okay, what can you give me for fifty bucks and some subway tokens?" And yeah. they just didn't have the resources to recruit to do this. They didn't have the resources to pen test. Well, it, have, it has to be something that's just like easy for both you know the company providing it and the small business. Yeah, and it was a tough sell all along because it was just like the ransomware thing. It was like when you go to those people and there's and the CEO's sitting there looking at you, and they go. Will it will it work? 
Mm. And, and as a consultant, you don't want to be going, well, it absolutely will, 100%. Because if you say that, you got a problem. You're on the hook. Yeah. And I, I'm never going to say that because, like we've said, nothing's 100%. It's impossible. So there's a lot of issues there, and that threat surface is huge, and it is good that there's stuff starting to trickle down. But it's always been a big problem, and, and you know, just disabling one or two things isn't going to do any good. And, and even sometimes the fact that something's not there means that they know something. Yes. I mean, so just you can't see something that ought to be there. And, you know, but, I mean, everything talks now. Every device in your network is broadcasting constantly and saying, hey, I'm here. All these IoT devices, everything. I mean, All of it, yeah. yeah. And, I mean, and even those devices can then give you information because even if you can't see what they're talking to, mm -hmm. you can figure out pretty quick what they're talking to by looking at the IoT traffic. Because if you're looking at well, it, you can go, oh, okay, yeah. there's the edge. And we, co we covered it a couple of weeks ago where they analyzed the protocol on the IoT device that was yep. communicating back up to the server. I think, was that yeah, last we, we I, talked about that? That was two weeks ago, yeah. We Basically, about they that. broke open the whole database and was like, oh, I can see every IoT device from this yep. manufacturer, yeah. and uh, it, it provided them with a map. So, totally. I mean, years ago, I talked about NTP and querying NTP to it actually leaked who was using that server as NTP, and it was a whole bunch of um d d link or netgear devices i think it was netgear devices so basically a specific query to an ntp server would spit back a list of oh here's who queried me for time and this particular ntp server was um accidentally put in there by it was like an ntp server university that netgear had like i don't know if it was netgear i'm just using an example had accidentally put in there and said, oh, all these million routers that we just shipped, mm -hmm. they all query this server for NTP. And that NTP server had the basically vulnerability that leaked exactly. back. Then Netgear has, I think the story was they had a remotely exploitable vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, as an attacker, now you just gave me a list of yep. everything. That's just that. follow that Didn't thread. matter. You could go to great lengths to hide yourself. And Unless you change you no the good. NTP server you were talking does to. you no good at matter. all. Because right. if, that, if that's compromised somewhere else and that list is right there, they've got your IPs, they've got everything mm -hmm. they need to know to go, oh, yeah, and they're running this compromisable product. Now, having said that, the VPN technologies that exist today, you really shouldn't have much of an external footprint no. at all. I just started using, I mean, you can configure WireGuard. In fact, I've done some WireGuard uh, installs, and that works really well. So you don't have to expose anything to the internet. Yeah, uh, it's WireGuard. Just it just works, right? Um, but you have to configure. It doesn't just work. But um, there's one. What's the company that that runs it? Um, Let's see. WireGuard is a as a what is it called? Ah, uh, no, I always blank on the name, and I use it. Uh, they sponsor like a bunch of Linux podcasts. Oh. God. What's it? What's it called? Anyway, it'll come to me. Tailscale. <laughs> Tailscale. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Tailscale. I you, Tailscale is free for a certain number of devices. I'm not saying you should just use it for free. Like it's totally <laughs> worth paying. Don't for. do this at home. But like, if you only get a couple of devices, they'll let you use it for free, and it just it just works, man. That's yeah. that's how. I mean, quite frankly, that's how I'm managing a, a few networks that I manage because it works. And they don't have to expose anything to the internet. Yeah, and I mean, the mechanics of being able to do that are starting to be here. Mm. The actual implementation of that is still not here yet because I think too many people don't take that next step of saying, we need to do this, we need to put this in place. But it's getting there. So maybe someday we can have that, that blank wall of, you can't see me, you don't know what I, you know. But Mr. Potato Head, back doors are not secrets. Uh-huh, exactly. <laughs> and IPNENE -E will always let everybody in. That's right, that's right. Um, we did medical devices, uh, modern memory concerns. This was a really cool article. I, I don't have a lot of color commentary to add to this one necessarily, but this one comes from NCC group and they talk about modern memory concerns as if you were implementing your own embedded system or IoT device. They talk about uh, volatile memory, SRAM, DRAM. In great technical detail, they hint towards Rohammer and RAM bleed, which we'll talk about next, um, in just a really, really cool in-depth technical article about memory, like physical memory safety issues and how to make the right decisions as to what you include uh, inside of your devices. So 
Um, what I liked about their article is they say all modern memory devices themselves contain computing elements, microcontrollers, and firmware to tame the complexities of modern interfaces and the complicated physics of memory technology itself. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Its functionality is backed by deeply embedded firmware within the memory controller. This firmware is frequently written in the C language where memory safety concerns pose a significant risk. These concerns increase as the firmware complexity increases, driving modern memory protocols such as NVMe becoming increasingly complicated. And that speaks to this stuff is complicated, which also means it's hard to secure. Well, every time you add an element... Yes. I mean, so... There's lots of elements when it comes to just... And you're adding... I want to say memory safe, but memory safety implies that we're talking about software. In this case, we're talking about more closer to the, the hardware, actual hardware safety, actual side hardware of it. safety of, of And memory. the more pieces you add to that, the more likely, especially when they're third-party pieces and they're being developed across multiple platforms and things, the more little pieces you add, just like your code, if you right. write a piece of code and it's 96 lines of C and you wrote it and that's all it is you can actually evaluate it when you start adding APIs and you start adding libraries and lambdas and all these other things. It's, it's the same problem it, as it gets more and more complicated. It's harder to understand. It's harder to map. And, and of course, all those things introduce the possibility of new threat vectors that you didn't perceive and plan for. Are you familiar with Ro the Rohammer attack? Do you remember that one? <sighs> Refre remind me and I'll remember it. The way I I remember I, the name, and I'm not sure exactly what the attack was now. The internet's not a series of tubes, but memory's essentially a series of tubes, yes. right? Mm -hmm. And if I can constantly read from a series of tubes in the memory, I don't say it's tubes, but it's capacitors, right? Oh, yeah. In memory, the electromagnetic interference bleeds to the other row right. and causes some and bits to flip in the other row, which then... The technical details of specifically how uh, escape me at the moment, but it allows you to then write to those other places in memory. That's a very high level, yeah. ninety nine percent accurate. I mean, it's a very memory. complex yeah. attack, but you know. Now, but glad you said that because Paul Ducklin wrote a fantastic article that it, that explains it and goes into the history of gaslighting and where gaslighting comes from. It was like an old <laughs> play from the thirties. I was like. Dude, he was on fire when he wrote this article. <laughs> um, and you probably should read other articles about kind of the basics of the row hammer attack uh, to do that. But basically, you're clobbering a uh, specific series of uh, capacitors in memory in order to cause... Uh, them that, to bleed over bleed into over other other tubes. into the adjacent into the adjacent. Right, the next capacitor, capacitor is right. actually receiving because they're so this. densely packing the uh, yeah. capacitors together on a, a, a DRAM chip. It's a lot like the old attack with trying to read the old MDM hard drive, uh, the bits around the bits. You could predict what the bits may have been, and I know there was a lot of discussion about that a long time ago, but it's kind of like that sort of attack as well. Surprisingly, perhaps DRAM chips have more in common with the mercury delay line storage of the 1940s and 50s. <laughs> Dude, he's on fire. and It was a fascinating uh, read. But I, so... But I think some of the things that is a newer attack with row hammer is you don't need to write to the row of memory. You just need to read it. I don't know if that's old or new. Read it really hard. It was. You're some, basically overloading it. So reading it really hard actually causes right. it to overload. I mean. It's, yeah. Reading from DRAM forces the hardware to write the data back to the right, same memory it. cells right away. So you need only need read access to a particular bunch of memory cells in order to trigger low-level electronic rewrites of those cells. Which can cause bit flipping in the Correct. adjacent capacitors. Correct. Correct. Yep. Just electronics. And so he talks about some new research about super cooking. Um, <clears throat> just you have to, read, have to read this article. It's a must read. Uh, my story number eight. It's a really good article. Yeah. I mean, if you have any interest in this at all, and even if you don't, you probably should read this. Mm. I, I think this is Agreed. a really good example of somebody truly exploiting <laughs> physics, which is, yes. to me, the yes. ultimate exploit. Yes. Uh, it, physics That's is, exactly where, what it is where everything sits, and if you can exploit physics, you can change anything. And, and so that's why this is, to me, very interesting, because you're now playing with the physics of the universe rather than just, oh, somebody wrote bad code. This is actually very smart kind of attacks.
for sure. Um, in other articles that I was, one article I was really surprised because based on the title, I thought it was clickbait. I, I go through a lot of articles in prep for the show, right? <laughs> clickbait? And there's a lot of freaking clickbait out there Imagine today. Imagine that. My story number four. Mitigate top five common cybersecurity vulnerabilities. Oh my God, here we go. This is four? 24. Oh, 24. <clears throat> okay, This is, and I thought this was going to be clickbait. clickbait. It usually is, yeah. And now it's not loading. Like the moment that I need this to load, <laughs> it doesn't load. Because I was literally like, oh, okay. So it loaded the second time I clicked on it. So whoever has remote shell on my computer, uh, <laughs> don't go into the PR0N folder. Um, <laughs> so mitigate the top five common cybersecurity vulnerabilities. Ready? Number one, inherited vulnerabilities. Modern software relies on various third-party libraries. In fact, now I'm not quoting from the article. But experts I've talked to in articles that I've read say roughly 70% of the software out there today relies on third-party open source libraries. Or it's 70% open source, something of the, the nature. I would right? say it's higher than that. So it, the number one in this article, yeah, I think, is spot on. Mm -hmm. And this was um, Melanie Tafelsky, uh, who wrote this article for Trend Micro. Great job. Uh, I would agree. Inherited vulnerabilities is a huge problem today. How often in the news, like oftentimes I skip it because it's the same thing. NPM, PyPy, uh, Java. Uh, I mean, you name a language or framework. Now, people love attackers, I should say, love to pick on NPM and, and Python. But I don't think that's because of deficiencies necessarily in their languages, frameworks, or packaging systems. It's just due to the popularity. Yeah. It's like why attackers will go after Windows and spend way more resources going after Windows than they would a Linux desktop because it's more popular. So I think that's why you got NPM and Python being attacked a lot more. And, and don't and forget about inherited inherited vulnerabilities. Uh, what do they call that? Transient. Well, that's inher transient, transient inheritance. And, and chaining trans and yes, all these things correct. because... It's the dependency of the dependency of the dependency. I mean, if, if I want to generate random numbers, I don't write all that code from scratch. No. I go download the library. Well, yeah. what's in that library? Open it up sometime. There's a whole bunch of stuff in there. There's more libraries, and yeah, then those I libraries have I libraries. I want to open it up. I just want to call the methods and functions inside that library. And that's what everybody <laughs> wants to do because, you know, you Same don't thing want for to... SSL, dude. I don't want to write my own SSL if library. I, gotta, I want someone really smart who wrote an SSL library. If I got to deconstruct it, all I might as well write it myself. It's going to yeah. take just as... It'll actually take less time if I just wrote it myself. You know I've had to do that? What, right, and right not with something? anything like a random number generator or anything like SSL because I'm not that smart. Jack, do you remember the WordPress library? Oh, yeah, dude. I, I, remember, I remember that. That was a nightmare. We, did I rewrite that one while I, you were here? You, no, you. I think you were. I mean, I think. Yeah, I remember you rewriting that yourself. Yes. And then I, I did think that. I might have taken a snap. I don't know. You helped that, me. You yeah. helped me with some of it as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that, that was like we were relying on a third oh, party. Dude, it was it was WordPress library, which wasn't which wasn't necessarily horrible, no, by the way. But like a lot of these libraries like are not well supported. Yeah, but that's what happened was that. <laughs> and yet, I, what a was lot it? Of the WordPress internet... WordPress changed. Something changed, and Jack and I were like, "Crap, that library doesn't work." No, yeah, and yeah. It, it, something something changed. That was like me trying to impress Jack. I'm like, I can rewrite it, mm -hmm. and I was like, <laughs> "Holy crap, that was." horrible but i but i did it and it rewrote it and i think largely it's still in use today which is kind of frightening <laughs> well there's funny. also that transient library creep in that as well so you use a library that you even go and evaluate it and you decide it's completely safe and then somebody updates it from somewhere else and, correct and that that creeps Creeks. in and you don't even know about it because you're like we checked this when we first wrote it but it's been updated right so uh, but so what this is talking about is inheriting specifically vulnerabilities like mm -hmm. what we're talking about is inheriting dependencies that impact the functionality of our primary app right guys I, as three of us are well yeah i mean know, three of you, us have worn our developer hats more than three times mm -hmm. in our life right so we're, we're hyper aware of the i'm using a library it changed and therefore it impacted the functionality of my app what melanie is talking about is i'm using a library it has a vulnerability. Yep. Log exactly. For, log, I mean, like, log for J is the shining example, right? It has a vulnerability. Therefore, I have a vulnerability in my app now. 
And, and I think one of the underexplored areas of that is actually like NPM mm. in general, mm. right? Like NPM. Well, it's has, PHP. Look at WordPress plugins. Yeah, but like, uh, uh, like I think NPM is especially interesting because, like, in the modern, you know, development stack, NPMs become so, you know, as like a package manager and like you know bringing you. You know, let's say you want to build. It's very dependency heavy well, in NPM. It's super yes. dependency yes. heavy. Yeah. Let's say you just want to build like, you know, a React web app with like I don't know a with node a simple form with, it, with a do, node back end, right? Like yes, and like, I built one that was a simple form, dude, and I th I had hundreds of dependencies. <laughs> and a so, simple form. <laughs> you know, run. Uh, I don't know uh, what a good tool for like Snick is actually a yes. good tool. Snick for this. is great. Yes, you know, and like run that on some of your projects, and you're gonna be like. Uh -oh. I'm gonna run. It's still I'm gonna run. You know screaming. what's funny? You say that I built a prototype. Yeah, you reactor. can build it into your CI/CD pipeline such that yes. it, you know flags like, "Hey, there's a supply chain." But I built a test app, and I think it still sends me alerts. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. I, I, still get, I, I have. I get alert. You know, like I. I'm like I just. I didn't ever deploy the software. I don't think it's even on a public <laughs> GitHub. It's in a private repo somewhere, but, and it I was mean, in a test app. I think like it's just one of those things people don't think a lot about. Yeah. Is like. They just pull in these random packages and, you know. Well, this is what I've talked about for years. I call the engineering problem, mm -hmm. which is engineers want to make things work. Mm -hmm. I get a problem. You call me and you say, I need a dev. I need this to work. I need a website. I need whatever. Right. I want to make it work. But then she talks about supply chain vulnerabilities, as yeah. se but as separate. And I, I love that she made the distinction between the two because they mm -hmm. are very separate in the context of what we're talking about we're talking about inheriting a dependency that breaks something or inheriting a dependency that introduces a vulnerability what melanie's now talking about is a supply chain uh threat that is someone has typo squatted a package and instead of me pulling in the right npm module i'm pulling in the attacker's npm module and that's yet a third scenario uh in in this inheritance kind of um threat model that we're talking about that is a huge problem today and this huge is accelerating problem. look at move it move it was they like got into move it and everyone pulled a software update that have malware in it yep that's that's the supply chain that, that melanie's referencing it's crazy. interesting that's still happening today it is someone just disclosed that they were part of that breach i forget who it was it was a big company <laughs> it was like oh yeah we were we were part of that too shell yeah, it just like it seems like every week more and people are coming. Out, yep, <clears throat> we were part of that too. <clears throat> code injection vulnerabilities, remote code execution, SQL injection, PHP code injection or server side JavaScript injection in our web. I mean, bug money hunters. This is the the one of the holy grails, right? And this is just in so many so many pieces of code. I mean, RCE is just do a doomsday scenario. I mean, if I can inject mm -hmm. code into you, I can it's do it's game anything. over. Yeah, I mean, I can do anything at that point. But your app is going to have inputs. And as hard as developers try, I feel like protecting And everything's the chained together. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I mean, under the surface, all code is chained together. I mean, that's, that's the whole how code works. I mean, ultimately, there's a pointer to a location, and that location is pointing to other locations and on and on and on. And mm -hmm. if you can get in that chain, you got them. And it is really tough to debug that stuff. Permission and access vulnerabilities. <laughs> And what, what I love about this is, I think I, I re-aired the Gary McGraw interview uh, in one of our Vault episodes. It might have been before we were calling it Vault episodes. And Gary describes the logic flaw, right? And he's like, I'll give you an example. The flaw is, forgot to authenticate the user. <laughs> and I did this in PeePeeWorks, Jack. Oh boy. I modified the logic so it didn't check the person's password. <laughs> nice. Because I locked myself out of the application. Oops. Oops. And I was like, I can't log in. And because I forget what the what technical mistakes that I had made to lead to this scenario where <laughs> basically the app is running, but I couldn't create new users mm -hmm. and I couldn't enter a, a valid password for an existing user. And I'm like, mm -hmm. well, I'm like, wait, this is one of those like really strange moments where you realize like, hold on, I hold all the keys to the kingdom. I can just go to the that's source part of, code. That's part of the risk, actually. It is part of the mm -hmm. risk because it totally is. I'm like, I can just go in the code and I can come on out the part of the code that 
actually checks for the user's password. I'm oh, like, really? cool, look, I'm in. Then I freaking forgot to uncomment it once I had gotten in, and then I push it to production. And that's permission and access vulnerabilities, mm -hmm. basically in a very oversimplified example. I mean, in a they, lot they of take, ways, that's they why take segmented like, authentication yeah. services and identity Correct. management is so important. And that's Correct. what I call the long, dark night of programming. Yes. And it's like, yes. you just get there and Well, no, like, I mean, it really wasn't, once I... It's interesting when, when I talk about that particular flaw that I uh, introduced into the application, it's one that is difficult. You have to have a specific test for it because a user will never find it. Yeah. I mean, maybe not never, but most of the time, they're, even if they fat finger their password that it works, like to the user, it's a, it's a benefit. They're like, this is great. Yeah. Doesn't even if I come close to my password, it still logs me in. That's the way it should work, right, Paul? I'm like, no, it shouldn't work that way. <laughs> Uh, security configuration error vulnerabilities. I, I like 13, 14 years ago, I think I was quoted on the show as saying misconfiguration leads to compromise. <laughs> and it's like it sure so, does. so true. I mean, this is your S3 bucket that's hanging out, yeah. you know, on the internet. It's this is your CH mod 777. Uh, um, yes. <laughs> it's a million different things that aren't anything we've talked about up until this point. But you've configured something poorly. And we've all done that. We've I mean, I, 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 again, it's, it's really, it, a lot of this is around the same kind of problems, which is just, I need to make this work. And I don't even know how many times, because one of the scripts I always used in audits was I, I searched for, I grepped, you know, 777 yeah. files. I was trying to find world writable files. And you found them so often. And it was always when the developers would look at it, they would go, oh, yeah, I remember that. We had to fix that, and it wouldn't work if we did anything else. So, you know, we just set it, and I, and I forgot to uncomment. I forgot yes. to go back and change it. We were just doing it to see if the rest of the code worked, and then we we're going to go back, and we forgot, and now the file got overwritten, and now we're screwed. And, you know, and, and, and people had to put, try to put procedures in to prevent that from happening in the future because it's so difficult because the long, dark night of programming will happen to us all, whether it's programming or not. You're going to be there. You're going to try to fix something. People are yelling. The world is burning, and you've got to get it working. And the CEO's on the line saying, "Why and is if Chamad seven seven fixes the pro seven 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 fixes the problem? I'll fix it later. I'll figure out why. But right I'll, now, we just got to get back in operations. And because you know, the problem is, you got to go back and you got to break it and go. Yeah. Oh nope, it's that permission on that file. It's that permission on this file, and you don't want to go back and break it because no, you you've don't. already been burned by it being broken once. I mean, almost every time I saw that, that was exactly what had happened. It wasn't because people were just inherently stupid. It was just because they were trying to get it working. Yes. And then I'll go back later, I'll sort it out on the dev box, I'll figure out how to make it work, and we'll, we'll re-implement. Mm -hmm. And then you just never get back to it because, you know, it's working. <laughs> you know, and I mean, you don't want that red light flashing. Oh, dude, great segue into Cisco urges to stop using weak crypto algorithms with <laughs> OSPF. <laughs> have you have you uh, messed with OSPF in your oh yeah, in your career, right? As oh, a, yeah. I mean installed it many times. Internal routing protocol. Yeah. Pretty common. It's an open it's source. Common. It's, it's I mean, an open source routing protocol that's supported by just about everything. Yeah. As opposed to eGrip or something like that, which is Cisco proprietary. So unless you have a very, very homogeneous network you tend to use OSPF over something like eGrip. eGrip's a better protocol. I mean, yeah. you know, it, it's IEG, just... IEGRP, But all right? it takes yeah, is yeah, yeah. I don't have all Cisco equipment. What is it? In, is it internal gateway routing protocol something? Well, it's, 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 enhanced, is, I, it's enhanced internal gateway enhanced routing protocol. Internal, yeah, iGrip yeah. Was, in, it was internal gateway routing protocol. Right. And OSPF is open, open, open shortest, shortest path, path first, first right. which is not really what it does. I don't... I don't I'm, well, it, it does, but... It does. Yeah, but it, that's not really the routing. Because it was better than... RIP. What is oh, yeah. RIP was RIP is routing or information it, routing, protocol. Routing information. Yeah. Yeah. RIP was horrible. It's not horrible. It's well, just not as robust as these you, modern protocols. Back to our previous conversation. If you configured this stuff properly, well, it RIP, was way better than if you didn't configure RIP it. RIP doesn't have the kind of weighting algorithms yeah. that OSPF and eGrip and things like that have. So it's a very simplistic protocol, which works fine in simplistic environments. And a lot of people can use RIP, and there's nothing wrong with it. The problem with OSPF is that 
most people use OSPF, they don't use any kind of encrypted OSPF or any kind of validated right. OSPF. So that means if I inject... But that's the encrypted communications between routers mm -hmm. to share the routing table. And valid right. and validating those devices. Right. So okay. it's not yes, even just the encryption. RIP, you could configure it so that anyone could inject routes into the system. You can do system. that with OSPF, yeah. too. And you can do OSPF so too. I can right. take a rogue device and stick it... And, and you can do it with eGrip, for that matter. Yeah, I can yeah, stick yeah. a rogue device in there that says, hey, I am also an OSPF device, please clue me yeah. in. And you will get all the information and you can push. Inject routes. You can force a new election, which will create the, the yes. sort of lead router where the table's stored. And by that, you can essentially poison the someone, OSPF. Someone did that on the university campus that I was or, at in a segment. They were transitioning from RIP to OSPF, which is, dude, when you've got a huge network, right? It was a 144-acre campus, tens of thousands of, of nodes on the campus. That's a lot of routing gear. Mm -hmm. And they were, still had pockets that were using RIP. Someone injected routes that routed everyone's traffic through them and caused the denial of service condition. They weren't doing it maliciously to sniff people's traffic, which is what we used to do back in the day. Yeah. We were on the internal network with RIP. We used to manipulate the routing table so it routed through us so we could do man-in-the-middle attacks. This person just made like the entire campus uh, whoever was using RIP to go through them and they couldn't handle the traffic, which means you drop a whole ton of package, which means a whole bunch of people are like, hey, the network's down. And we're like, hmm, that's kind of interesting. And we dug into it. It was because, ah, oh, we had this like one set of routers that were still talking with RIP and it wasn't using the proper, because I think you could configure RIP to have a, a passphrase to be able to inject can. routes. You don't right? have you to, could. but you can. And I think this one was misconfigured from like way back in the day, legacy well, stuff. That it didn't, and it hadn't been cut over to OSPF in the whole. Well, some thing. of these are done not even in, in, in a rogue way; they're just done by accident. By because, accident. It was, this was an you know, accident. Yeah, Doctor Han accident. decides yeah. to plug his old router back in in his lab, and the thing's right. got a configuration from 12 years ago, and the thing comes live and takes over, and you got a big problem. Right. But in in the modern age, they've started encrypting this traffic. Yeah, so not only authenticating it to say who can participate in the routing there's, table. Right. There's two steps there. Yes. So one is you need to know that another device is legit. So that, that yes. all these devices, when they talk, so this is the sort there of was password. A key, but there was a key, a password. Well, was, uh, it could a be a password. A passphrase? Well, there was it's something. a hash, actually. Yeah, there was, it's been a long time. Well, you initiate it with a, with a password. So you yeah. put a password in the con, in Cisco anyway, and it's, you put a yeah. password in, and then that becomes the sort of operating password for all the devices. Right. Now, the problem with that is it's not encrypted. Right. And that means anybody sniffing can see those packets. And, and uh, they're big, obvious, fat packets that you can easily detect. Multicast? Was it multicast? Or it's, I don't remember. I feel like it was different versions of OSPF well, and different implementation. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. A, it's a constant broadcast, broadcast update. And you could sniff it because it was It's broadcast. easy to sniff, but yeah. you know what the packet looks like. You can see the header. You can grab it. In that packet, then, you can find the password just like a telnet. I mean, it's right. the same thing. So once you know the password, you own the whole place. But they started encrypting that. They so start encrypting these yeah, exchanges. Yeah, yeah. And so what Cisco's advocating for is the use of strong encryption because they're very, very worried uh, not only about quantum computing right. and all that stuff, but they're just worried about people cracking, people cracking this it. really so lame this isn't, encryption. This isn't make sure you authenticate who can participate in the routing table decisions. This isn't protecting that communication with encryption this is using this is like the next iteration which is yes. make sure you're using strong encryption standards yes. for ospf now my whole thing on this story doug was this is going to be a slow migration oh yeah because let's say you've got a few hundred routers in your inter and it, again every enterprise is different i'm kind of old school a lot of people are in the cloud and, and all that stuff and still like, got routers but you still got routers all right virtual so, routers same problem let's say you get 100 routers and they all have to share <clears> routes <throat> and make decisions about mm -hmm. routing they need a secure way to communicate let's even say you've established that they're using uh md5 or whatever like one of the the old ones um sha1 right now <laughs> But now you've got to change that. Mm. Now you've got to you've got to go to SHA two fifty six or a better uh, hashing algorithm. Well, you just how do you how do you update all hundred routers at once? And there's another problem there that now you're there's leaving network out. there's network engineers that are jumping up and down right now because you, you know the answer, and I love and appreciate you for that because I, I I've not had to make this transition in OSPF because I haven't dealt with it in a long time. 
But I got to imagine this is challenging for you folks. Well, not go, just that. We got to switch how the the encryption algorithm or the hashing algorithm that's used in this particular scenario. That's a whole, if you've got a hundred route or whatever it is, that's a project, dude. But right? don't forget, that's bad. But there's another part of the problem. There's actually two other parts. The first part of it is not every piece of hardware supports this. And the second part of that Bingo. problem that sucks even more is not every version of Cisco supports crypto. Bingo again. And then when you call Cisco and they go, well, how many routers do you think you have that are still running this version or do not have this feature set? And you go, about half. They go, yeah. okay, well, it's 10,000 a piece. Uh, you know, make the check out to Cisco. And sorry, Cisco, I so, love you, but you know. But you either have to, best case in this scenario you just described, I got to upgrade firmware. Yep. to get the latest support. Worst case scenario is I got to replace the hardware. Yeah, or and upgrade the memory. And that's a whole other... I mean, it may just be a memory update to increase the feature set. So you got to pay Cisco for the right. feature set and you got to pay Cisco for the hardware to support the feature set. And suddenly it's a large budget item that you're going to have to put down and go, well, we'll try to work that in three years from now. And that's why stuff doesn't get updated because it is very challenging. It's very easy to say update. It's, it's so hard. Very <laughs> difficult to actually do. And then you've also got, I was oh, at, I was at the university that I described hundred, I mean, it's in my LinkedIn profile, right? There's no, no big secret, but I was at Brown university when we were making the transition from we have this network here and these cables and oh my God, we have to replace, mm -hmm. mo I mean, we replaced most of the cabling in a 144 acre campus, a lot of cabling that was, I mean, we're talking multiple miles worth of cable that was replaced. We're talking thousands of switches, probably order a magnitude, a hundred routers. Mm -hmm. To go like we need to do this whole network <laughs> upgrade process. And we got to do it this weekend. But that process, from start to finish, took a, a two years. Yeah. I mean, I mean, from the like when someone first realized like we're gonna have to upgrade this stuff. Like we can't have students coming into dorms, and there's like ten base T anymore. <laughs> <laughs> like this, like so like that. That was like the first telltale sign. But then we had to go. We need to like have someone do a project like we need to manage this project and the scope of that project was probably one of the largest projects that i ever worked and, on and we had researchers who had grant funded projects yeah. that had to be approved by like say the department of defense and they couldn't just change hardware they couldn't no. just change anything because no, the a slightest lot of dependence, tweak yeah a lot of suddenly turned were, into yep. this is a, a classified top secret yeah now network. you need approval from the person and we can't just the guy just can't install program, a yeah. patch he can't just update it or install yep. anything they have but to go also, through this whole but, process but that's the time to and i don't want to say that i was like the wisest most knowledgeable person at the time but i want to say i i did recognize the opportunity to go hey because i worked in the network group at the time I was like, guys, this is this is awesome. Like, I'm, I'm eating this up. It's a great experience, and this is great for the university, because I don't want to see students having to use ten base T. First of all, right? And like, we're getting all this new gear. I helped evaluate some of the new gear, and security was part of the project. You give props to the university at the time. Security was very much part of it. I was evaluating evaluating intrusion detection systems and firewall capabilities and all this stuff. I was like, now's the time to go. Let's make sure when we do this upgrade that part of it is when we upgrade OSPF and all these routers that we do it securely, that we have TACX for authentication, that we have encryption on all of our routing protocols and all of our, um, the other thing was making sure there was encryption in, what was Cisco's HSRP? Cisco HSRP? Yeah. Yeah. High, so. high speed availability, something high, the high availability thing. Understand. Like basically you had two routers and they ARP for the same, default yeah. gateway and they'd automatically fail over but the way they ship very similar to ospf the way they shared information that i believe that could also like be encrypted so someone couldn't oh, it, it sniff that be, yeah. and put themselves in the hsrp and then make failover happen and go all your traffic now goes through me that was yeah. an attack back in the day if i recall correctly um so i'm like now's the time we we do security like if we're going to do this let's implement it with the highest security level that's feasible so that down the road this is all about technical debt down the road we don't have as much technical debt unfortunately as we're covering the article that was written uh 12 days ago right 
there are people out there with technical debt that have to deal with this it's problem. And it sucks. Yeah. I mean, and you've also can talk. You could bring this up and not just talk about OSPF. You could talk about STP and VTP yeah. and all these other protocols, CDP that are all also running in your network. Right. And that kind of goes back to that article, uh, the no knock stuff. Yes. about these are other ways people can discover things in your network and they're often unsecured and this is back into the doug you and mr spock uh thing a story i've told so many times where the guy said nobody understands this stuff nobody would ever figure it out except you and mr spock and i'm like really a 12 year old kid can figure this out and they didn't believe me but they do now maybe Yes. Boy, that was a rant there, a that was, Cisco rant. That was that was good. We I had to dig I deep. I love getting a Cisco deep one. in the Paul database of experience there. It, I love it when you talk about something I know something about. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it happens occasionally. It happens occasionally. Yeah. Usually not, but every now and then. Um. Old certificate, new signatures. So this is kind of interesting. Like basically. Attackers can, there's a, a so with driver signing, attackers want to install a kernel module because it gives them deeper access. So this is my whole, attackers want to gain higher privilege to be able to have greater persistence, to achieve stealth, to hide from detection technologies, mm -hmm. and to have a greater impact. So to me, it's kind of like this trifecta that I talk about, specifically with firmware, but as we look at the like layers in uh, modern computers today, you know firmware is one layer, and obviously in your boot sequence, right? Your bootloader loads your kernel, kernel loads the rest of the operating system. Kernel still a very low level component, and that's what attackers are going after. So, uh, but kernel modules like in most modern like Windows. Linux too, if you've got uh, secure boot, uh, per, well, secure boot's kind of a different process, but Windows has the concept of, of signed drivers because it's more of a monolithic control from Microsoft. They can say, hey, any driver that gets loaded in our, our operating system has to be signed. Well, has to be signed is kind of a, well, yeah, they make, they make exceptions because how did, I think it was one of my coworkers that put it this way. They want grandma's printer from 15 years ago they want those drivers still work, to still yeah. work. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, and that's why they won't just go in and say, we don't accept a certificate that's this old. So the third exception creates a loophole that allows newly compiled driver to be signed with a non-revoked certificates issued prior to or expired before July 29th, 2015, provided that certificate chain to a supported cross-signed certificate authority. Basically, that means... Look, if you've got a valid certificate for a driver and it's before 2015 and it hasn't it's not on the known revoked list, like we're going to we're going to honor that kind of yeah. stuff. So there's shenanigans that are being played with the way Microsoft treats drivers and specifically the dates. Um so if a driver is successfully signed this way, it will not be prevented from being installed and started as a service. As a result, multiple open source tools have been developed to exploit the loophole. And the article goes into in-depth details as to how you can get these open source tools that essentially, I mean, every, like the, the dirty, not so secret is that everyone, everyone can figure out a way to get around driver signing. Like it's, yeah, it's because there's no easy way to revoke drivers. If I mean, I'm, like so, you said, grandma's printer, but it's not just grandma's printer. It's my car. You know, it, it's everything. Mm -hmm. And you can't force all these driver updates to happen constantly as these things get revoked. So it, it's very complicated, I think, because there's but so also, much. But also, I can spend $100. I can spin up an LLC, mm -hmm. right? Then I can spend $300. And I can go buy a, a driver signing certificate. Yep. Yep. And then I can sign my drivers. Mm -hmm. That'd be totally valid with them, provided I meet their their guideline. Because yeah. some of this is the Microsoft does some level of validation before they will they honor the the driver. Right. That was part of some of the newer things that happened uh, uh, post 2015. But but I can I can do that. And you can do it over and over and over again. I mean, if they yeah. if they catch you once and they revoke it, you, you can just I go back I remember talking to pen testers 10 plus years ago that are like, 
Oh, I just get around that because yeah. we spun up a phony LLC. We bought we a so yeah. we registered a cert, and then like it's a code signing cert, and it's three hundred bucks. And then when that one gets burned, and buy another one. Go, go buy I'll another buy fifty. Right and up guess front. what? Attackers do that. Guess what? You could probably go on the internet in the shady places of the internet. I won't say the dark web, right? But like, because it's not necessarily Sketchier the dark place. place. You could go to the dark web. You could go to sketchy. What do they call it? The, the not dark web. The gray market. The gray. The gray market. Yeah. Yeah. You like can go that. on the public yeah. internet. You could buy. You could buy one, right? Yeah. Or someone's leaked one, and someone has that. But you just can buy do a whole that, bunch at just, once. That way, when they get revoked, you don't have to try to get new ones. Yes. And and set them all up. You, with, you guys are giving them the playbook here. You got to be careful. The best. Of, the best of us hold some of those. Like I found this one, and it's a cert, and no one really knows that. It, maybe you found one that you has been leaked, and no one knows it's been leaked. That's actually a good honeypot. Yeah. To put, yeah think think about it. you. You put it out on the internet. You know. Oh, like you know. Yeah. We'll give you cert. Right. <laughs> sure. And free cert, <laughs> and then you know you want to go find who's doing interesting things with it. You go look look for that cert. True enough. Mm -hmm. But it's a mess. Microsoft in response has blocked all certificates discussed in the blog post. This was from Talos. Um, Talos Intelligence. My story number nine. Mm -hmm. Great art. You should also go read that. That was a great article. They explained it very well. But even then, they're just blocking things that they found. So they're not blocking it. Right. You know, they don't have a they're way not, to... Well, you can't prevent the... I spun up an LLC and I bought a cert right. scenario. Because they're just blocking ones that were reported. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a problem. I want to talk about the vulnerability landscape for a moment too, because I, I this was really, I thought Qualys did a nice job explaining, if you go to my story number six, what, what I liked about this, and this is what I've always suspected, and I think jives with what we, we've talked about in the past on the show, is they, they term this the vulnerability threat landscape, right? And look, I, we'll get into it, but I'm not saying you just got to patch like a small number of stuff and then like you're secure. Not what I'm saying at all. But when we look at vulnerabilities or exposures in our environment that are a result of a vulnerability in software that I have in my environment, that's just one kind of vector, right? So... The universe of all known vulnerabilities, and I think they get this from NVD, there's 206,037 mm -hmm. known vulnerabilities. Now, I would just want to also preface this with research that I've previously done that Josh Coleman and I years ago compared notes on came to the same conclusion that even if it's today, 200, roughly 200,000 vulnerabilities are not every single vulnerability that exists out there today. Sure. Those are just 200,000 known vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. We've already talked about supply chain things, inherited vulnerabilities, configuration mistakes, that, and other stuff, other attack vectors that aren't included in that 200,000. So like, we're just talking about like known vulnerabilities in software. Like There's some flaw in software that you might be using. Yep. Numbers around 200,000. They say that 77,000, almost 78,000 vulnerabilities with an exploit available. Not sure where that particular number came from, but it's interesting how greatly reduced that number gets when we get to vulnerabilities with weaponized exploit code, which is 2.24% of that roughly 200,000. So 4,615 vulnerabilities with weaponized exploit code. I can, I can get the, I kind of, that's a, a big difference, 77,000 versus 4,000, but I kind of get like there's maybe a proof of concept for that exploit. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I don't know, there's also a whole thing of like, there could be an exploit for something that we, that no one knows about yet. Sure. Right. Anyway, then we get down to, uh, CISA KEV known exploited vulnerabilities from CISA 965. So we go from 4,000 to 965 in the CISA KEV. Those are <clears throat> and CISA maintains that <clears throat> someone has observed this exploit in the wild. How do they, where do they get those vulnerabilities from? <clears throat> Various sources, I think. I think it's um, like folks like Microsoft or... Yeah. Uh, Talos. Yeah, Talos or wherever is like, we observed this in the wild. And CISA has its trusted 
partners. Partners that, yeah. That, yeah that well, you, I mean, you see stories all the time from like Huntress Lab or somebody yeah. that says, we've seen this being, you know, we've, we've got evidence this is being right. exploited here. We observed it. We saw yeah. the traffic. So I'm guessing, yeah, that they have their trusted sources. We get on it exploited by malware. So this may be inside of a malware sample. We've seen mm-hmm. the exploit being used 829. Yep. Exploited by threat actor 651. Named vulnerabilities. Log for shell. Heartbleed 555. Exploited by ransomware 271. So like we just went from in a matter of a minute or two. <laughs> Down to 200,000 down to 271. And when you take that 271 and you strip out everything that doesn't apply to you. you yeah. I mean, if, oh, you, yeah. if you say we don't use move it. No. Okay. So let's, let's strip that way on down to just what applies to us. It starts it because one of the problems I've always had with vulnerabilities is it becomes overwhelming. People just sure. give up because, because you look at that two hundred thousand. You go, like, how the hell can we ever possibly yes, defend against right. this? It's impossible. But when but, you get it down to something manageable, well, let's go ma- manageable. Is there something good that just sorts? <laughs> no, seriously. There's a lot of solutions that'll help you evaluate what vulnerabilities you have and then tag and classify them with. This is on this. It's like I like the the breaking point for me is when we go from four thousand six hundred and fifteen to nine hundred sixty five. Mm. That 965 is the system known exploited vulnerabilities. Now, I don't know if all 965 are included in all the rest that I mentioned after yeah, that. Yeah, where's their overlap? Like exploded you know? by, yeah. So yeah. I don't know if you got to like add those numbers together or diff the 965, 829, 651, 551, 271. Is anyone aggregating the different databases? Yeah, there's, yes. Yeah. Often, I mean, there's lots of companies that that's their livelihood, right? Is just tracking and mm. scoring and vul- Kenna does some of that stuff. Vicarious does some of that stuff. Um, yeah. All the big VM companies have some kind of, you know, scoring mechanism and, and whatnot. But I guess what we're coming down to is like, if you're going after a really good vulnerability management program today, I, I would start I'm not saying this is the end all be all, mm. right? But I would start with the 965 and in, in all those other sure. kind of categories, right? Yeah. I'd start with what's being exploited by ransomware, what has a name associated with it, what do we know is being exploited by threat actors, malware. Let's focus on those. Yeah. Yeah. And then, I mean, if you're looking at them by CVSS scores, too, not really great. Yeah. No. Well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's a place to start. I mean, to say how likely is it we're going to be subject to this. I mean, obviously you want to fix as many as you can, but when you get down to these things that are pretty obscure. It's or like pretty, the least bad, basically. Well, they're difficult to do or, they're, you know, I mean, you have to assume some risk. Nobody See, but can, I, don't, I don't know that CVSS takes into account actively exploited. I think it's why no, we it have, does. that's why we have the Kev from CISA. Yes, say, but it does take into account the complexity of, of the attack. Like, how difficult is it to actually do? Yeah, but I don't... I mean, that just means there's someone out there really smart. Well, and, I'm, but I'm not... Only, so my argument to that is it only takes one smart person to figure it out. And that just... That doesn't mean that that one smart person is holding it for themselves. I mean, that one smart person figured out... He just has to out, post, you know, this is how to exploit it. Dude, they're selling it, right? Well, they're, no, they're I selling mean, it's, it's after very that point. And then, kitty doable. and then it's out there. But then it's out there for the so-called... But if it requires a very, very specific set of conditions to actually occur, it's like yeah, how... Con- I guess if you have to like do It's like how contagious well, is yeah, something. Sure. But, yeah, but that's likelihood. In, sure. it, it is, but I mean, it's like how contagious is this virus? You know, I mean, if it's really hard to get it, and then it, it becomes less of a threat than something that is airborne and you can catch it on the subway riding home from work. I mean, those are very different things. And it's like, oh, the only way you're going to ever get this is with a blood transfusion. I mean, you can start categorizing. And I'm not yeah, saying... But, you- I think, but I think the ones that are in use by attackers today are the more reliable ones that you have to pay well, that's attention That's what I'm talking to. about. Yeah. I yeah. mean, so attackers yeah. are going to use stuff that works. Correct, correct. And, and that's that means- what I think you should focus on is like... The foundation of your vulnerability. I mean, I think we're program. saying the same things. Yes. We're just saying like, it in different ways because different patch, lingos for patch it. that stuff. For like d- my whole thing is like, don't get hung up on all these other factors. Is to what I like about this Qualys article is 
they deem these as roughly 5.3 uh th so maybe these are independent ones and they've i don't know how much they've cross-referenced it but like so they're they deem it as high risk vulnerabilities 5.3 thousand so 5300 <clears throat> vulnerabilities right that's the vulnerabilities with weaponized exploit code all the way down <coughs> looks like they added all those numbers together you get 5,000. Find that 5,000 in your environment and go patch that at all times. And, and like I'm, that, just I'm just trying to give people actively, hope. Yeah, you know, get, that's I mean, your hope. That's your hope and, right there. And the other go be patching that at all times. And I'm, the reason I'm saying at all times is you're constantly looking for these vulnerabilities. Someone could spin up a VM or something somewhere and it has a vulnerability. You need to nip that in the bud. This is an active process making sure your environment does not have what in this graph amounts to a roughly 5,000 vulnerabilities. Make sure you don't have those. You're in much better shape than you were before. Okay. I'm not saying you're done. I'm not saying that's going to protect against a lot you're of the never other done. threats out there. You're never done. You're never fully protected against all the threats that are out there. But man, that puts you in much better shape. Mm. It does. It's a, it's a place to start. And you've got to do it. If you don't right. do this, you're done. I mean, somebody is going to come get you. And so you've got, but you, you have to find a way. And I guess my whole point is trying to find ways to sort of pitch this to management, to get the support, to do it. Because when you go in and say there's 200,000 vulnerabilities, you're, nobody's going to buy into this. It's just too impossible. It just sounds like a, a hopeless task. If this is to me the, like the bare minimum of what you need to be doing. Yeah. We have so many options for beverages. <laughs> this is... That's wow. good. I don't know what to patch. F I mean, drink first. What to patch for? <laughs> don't drink instead of patch. That's right. Well, patch and then, well, then drink. You can, yeah, patch first, then drink. Yeah, that's good. That's sound advice. Yeah, actually. Um, and you'll probably need to. Oh, we gotta talk about roots of trust. You guys know Matthew Garrett? I don't think so. Oh, he's awesome. I we really need to get him on the show. But he, I think he was on. Talking about something very specific, he was on Security Cryptography Whatever, which is a fabulous podcast, by the way. Um, he's, he's amazing. I, his blog is amazing. His work in firmware security and roots of trust, really, is amazing. It has a great article titled, Roots of Trust Are Difficult. Um, it's hard to summarize this article. Uh, he talks about measured boot and verified boot. Um, the latest episode of Below the Surface, no, second to latest episode, I think it's 11 with Steve Oren was talking about, Steve Oren works at, at Intel, and he was talking, I asked him specifically to differentiate measured boot versus secure boot and some of the, and Intel boot guard and how, how those things are actually all different technologies, right? Um, so, but I think before you read this article, go listen to that podcast because it'll give you a great foundation. Then you can go read Matthew Garrett's article where he says a straightforward implementation of verified boot has the firmware verify the signature of the bootloader or kernel before executing it. In this scenario, the firmware is the root of trust. It's the first thing that makes a determination about whether something should be allowed to run or not. As long as the firmware behaves correctly, big assumption, and as long as there aren't any vulnerabilities in our boot chain, big assumption, we know that we booted an OS that was signed with a key that we trust. But what guarantees that the firmware behaves correctly? Enter a whole different set of technologies. What if someone replaces our firmware with a firmware that trusts different keys or hot patches the OS as it's booting it? That's a boot kit. We can't just ask the firmware whether it's trustworthy. Trustworthy firmware will say yes, but the thing about malicious firmware is that it can just lie to us, either directly or by modifying OS components, probably not sufficiently trustworthy. Mm -hmm. But then he goes on to talk about how we establish a root of trust, that the, how the, I mean, essentially we have to trust Intel, right? At, yep. its, at its core, the, the, the reset vector is going to come up and then start this chain of trust. We have things like measured boot, Steve Oren described, uh, how do you describe measure boot? Like you're, you're hashing the thing that's happening now with the thing that happened 
before what, the last the previous the previous yeah. thing that happened mm -hmm. as an attestation and you're looking for anomalies and, and, and that happened for anomalies in and then between the, those yeah, two, yeah, yeah, those yeah. Two iterations. Um, so all that stuff like you could enable on Intel processors anyway is what I was uh, my question actually during that episode when I was asking Steve was is this stuff we have to like enable it's like all in there like again it comes back to configuration you have to make sure it's configured correctly in order to do that but also like what this article highlights is it it's hard to have this something has to be ground zero for the root of trust yes if that thing is compromised we're all screwed now the likelihood that that original thing is compromised is probably really small like eh. yeah <laughs> if intel were to lose the private key that uh seeds the root of trust in the cpus for boot guard let's say mm -hmm. that would be really bad that would be really bad if microsoft were to lose a private key that initiates mm -hmm. the root of trust for secure boot micro like if microsoft lost that key it would basically there is a key at microsoft that if it was compromised basically compromise the integrity of just about 85 85 yeah. i mean crazy. Yeah, it would be crazy how like secure boot would be i mean i mean i, I essentially I, used I it would be that, a bad it would be a bad i think scenario. you're starting to get into that realm of like now you're talking about nation state threats and things like that where Could be, yeah you know I mean, I'm not saying it can't happen. I'm just saying you're talking about a really big picture kind of compromise at that but point. But also, like, as an enterprise, when you're evaluating risk, the likelihood of that happening is really small, mm -hmm. right? So you almost have to accept that, that risk, but then make sure that everything else that happens after that is valid, right? Like, the, now you get into the how the manufacturers and other folks within that chain of trust who made these behaving. chips who wrote yeah. this firmware where do they get it who or how they if, how, if they lost a key can i go test for like are the they going to tell me that they lost the key yeah <laughs> well if, if they lost the key and we find the key then we know that they lost the key yeah even we, whether they're telling or if, not yeah like, but if we don't know key. and nobody reveals it and now you're back into the like well would would the but an attacker has to use that attack in some if there's a piece of malicious firmware out there that's signed with let's say an msi key because they had a leak right we would eventually discover that eventually 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 it'd be bad times until we did but right? but i also i also have the ultimate paranoia of is there a you know an entity hanging on to this stuff because it's not right you know it is a nation state and they're saying at some point we may need to use this yeah. Oh, I'm sure someone is just banking these You up. know they do. You know I mean, they do. I mean, nothing is more Chinese than the idea that I hold, Hanging these, on to keys, I hold yeah. these things forever, and just in case, because that's that long game. Well, it's the whole, like, like the, I, almost, I almost feel like the threats that are coming against you aren't going to be super stealthy or sneaky necessarily. It's just going to be normal business operations. Until I, it's not. To give you an example of one thing that I, I really hate. Oh, and I left it on my desk. I bought this really freaking cool DJI gimbal. Oh, oh. They're, they're, they've been in the news a bit. Dude, but this thing is awesome. Awesome. Now, I just got it last night. I put my smartphone on it, right? And it's like the coolest freaking gadget mm. ever. Like, you put your smartphone on it and, like... It's very cool. You if Once you learn I, how I, to, I got one of the first Phantoms. Yeah, so you know how to... I don't know how to use a gimbal yet. Like, I'm mm. just learning... But like you can create awesome video. I created. I bought it so I could create videos for it's my a own steady cam. YouTube. Yeah, it's like yeah. a yeah, it's a gyroscopic steady cam gimbal. Yeah, and, and you can, but you can create like cinematic uh, effects with it. Oh, and it's, stuff it's, like, it's, it's really it, cool. They use it for movies. Yeah, yeah. But uh, so they make ones that uh, a ton of them. DJI makes, I think, some of the the better ones mm -hmm. that you can use on your smartphone, and they're not that expensive. They're like between a hundred, two hundred dollars for ones for your smartphone. Mm -hmm. Oh, what got me was at the wedding. <laughs> There you go. There was the videographer, mm -hmm. and I was like, "That gimbal is like." Cool. She had a, a, a Canon whatever on it, or or some kind of really yeah. nice camera on it with a really nice lens, and she had this awesome gimbal. And she was there's a motor on these things that you can. It's like a joystick video game kind of thing, moving the camera on the gimbal. I'm like, that thing's really good. We're in the church. I'm like on my phone. I'm like. Because I saw the name on the side, it was a Ronin. And I'm like, I'm like, tell my wife, I'm like, I think it's like 
the thing that holds a camera. Like, I think it's $550 just for the thing that holds a camera. She's like, you are such a nerd. I'm like, we established this already. Long then time ago. Cousin Pat. I go to Cousin Pat. I'm like, did you see that gimbal? He's like, oh, yeah, the Ronin. He's like, those things are awesome. <laughs> of course you know what it is. So then I had to go buy one because right? it's Amazon Prime Day. Mm -hmm. I had to go buy one. Then I install the app mm -hmm. from DJI because you need the app to, yeah. to control it. DJI wants you to sideload the app. I'm like, what do you mean you're what? not in the... I'm like, you're not in the Google Play Store? I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, yeah, you need to sideload the app. I'm like, okay. Uh -oh. I'm like, what permissions do you want? They're like, we need your location. All of them. I'm like, what, the f what do you mean you need my location? You don't need my location. Oh, we need your location to find your device. They have to adjust for the rotation of the earth. I'm like, no, you don't. I'm like, disable location. It's like, no, I, I can't find your device unless you enable a location. Mm. I'm like, all right, well, the first time you discover my device, I'll enable location. And then I went in the app permissions and I disabled location. Then I relaunched the app and I went back in. They're like, no, I can't find your device. I'm like, oh. you know what my device is. Like, you know the MAC address of my device. Mm -hmm. You don't know to go rediscover it. You only need to discover it once. And no, it wants my location again. Mm -hmm. And then I talked to some of my friends and they're like, you have to go get a burner phone and that's your phone you use on your Kimball. <laughs> Hey, I don't know. Oh, roots of trust. Mm. I don't. Tr now I'm like, because I, I didn't trust DJI when it started, but they just happened to make like a really cool gimbal. In any case, mm. and this stuff is just penetrating every aspect yes. of the world right now. I mean, I mean, maybe not everybody's buying the Uber Nerd full metal gimbal, but I mean, they're it buying. Is, it is. Oh, they're is buying something. Yeah, the and, drones. The drones are the same thing. And that, Pop okay. this up, you know, to manage every little thing in your house is wanting to side load yep. or, you know, wants full permissions or it wants this permission. And 90%, 99% of the people in the world have no idea what any of this stuff is you're talking about. No, that, this had like amazing reviews on Amazon. And dude, no one talked about how you had to side load the app that wants the location information. I'm like, ah. I should have bought the gimbal that wasn't <laughs> DJI that got <laughs> worse reviews. But probably still wanted me to. Yeah, I've started now. worrying about reviews. <laughs> really bad. Every time you look at a product, you're just going, "Wow, why does this have like ten thousand amazing reviews that say almost exactly the same thing?" I started looking. I quit looking at five star reviews and only look at four star reviews now because I don't trust the five star reviews anymore. That's an interesting strategy. Well, I used to. I used to. I ignored all good reviews and I don't look at bad reviews because I don't. I don't trust good. Can I have reviews. lighter over there? Can I have that lighter? Yeah. And I don't trust the good reviews anymore. And now I don't even trust the really good reviews because they're also fake. I was looking at something the other day. It was like a, it was like a thing for a bird bath. It's not IoT or anything like that. It's a very simple gadget. But, you know, I mean, you it was like... You don't have an IoT bird bath, dude? No. Come uh, on. I don't have an IoT anything. Come on. My doorbell's Blame. a goddamn bell you ring. Oh, come um, on. <laughs> with a hammer. I, I'm, I'm with Larry. I'm not putting that stuff in my house. But I mean, I was just, I was looking at the reviews and there's like 5,000 reviews of this thing. You're like, very good. Love it. I use every day. And you're like, oh my God. And you know, you have to get down to the like four star reviews before people start going, well, this works pretty well, but it doesn't have an attachment, you know? And it's like, oh, okay. Maybe all these five star reviews are fake. Mm -hmm. Yep. A lot of fake reviews out there. It's really tough. And of course, chat GBT writes great reviews. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, yes. I could totally see that. Oh, I've, I've been practicing with it. Well, yeah, I think so. Our listeners know because I I disclose when I use ChatGPT. That's good. And I'm like, I'll pull an episode from the vault, <laughs> right? We do those vault yeah. episodes, and I'll take the YouTube video and I'll use ChatGPT for YouTube and yeah. it generates yeah, yeah, a summary. Yeah, we talked about this a little. Yeah, while. and I'll be like, I told you I did that. Like I felt bad. ChatGPT says. This is what the summary is. You know, I right. wanted to say something too before. So I we can do that. It can totally write a review before I forget again. If you didn't watch the vault stuff last week, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, if you missed Which that. Which one did you like? Mine. Oh. <laughs> he just likes watching himself. You like watching yourself? I watched, I watched the old SDL ones. We, we had two oh, old. Oh, so you went to. Uh, okay. We had so two on, on Security Weekly News, you're rerunning SDL? Yeah, because we didn't have Security Weekly News live last no, I love week. It. So we ran a No, because more people should have watched SDL. We pulled a couple yeah, old agree. Uh, Secure yeah. Digital Live stuff. And, and Good I, for you. I did watch the old uh, Security Weekly one. I don't remember what it was now, but Bill I did. Ches I, the latest one's Bill Cheswick. Yeah, okay. And, yeah. and it was great. And it was so much fun to go back and watch some of those old things and uh, and see them. So if you, if you, I mean, I'm not just pitching my show, but if you didn't watch those last week, 
go watch some of them because they are a lot of fun. And everybody had vault stuff last week, so yeah, uh, it's. Definitely I had one. It, there was uh, it, it, our listeners know, uh, and if you missed it, make sure you t- go back and watch it. If you did catch it, go tell your friends. Um, <clears throat> the Loft Group. I interviewed uh, a, a whole bunch of Loft folks. Some of those folks had never been interviewed on a podcast before. Oh, I did watch that one. Yeah, I saw your, I saw, I guess, your chat GPT written review of it. And I was like, oh, I want to watch that. It was like silicosis and tan, like folks that. Yeah, the low fat was. They have not been interviewed on any other podcast before. Before, Or again, or since, yeah. Or since. It was the only chance you would have to hear from some people that That were were so. Part of the law, they gave the testimony, they were there when they gave the testimony, but just didn't, don't get it. Yeah, they they actually. It's not, it's more so they didn't want to be in the spotlight kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, at the time, one of my coworkers helped, um, uh, Space Rogue helped me uh, get in touch with those folks and bring them on. He's like, dude, you should really have these people on. I'm like, yeah, dude, like you were there. I trust you. Yep. And I recognize these members, but like they haven't really talked publicly, but they did on that one. So that's make sure ho- that. that's cool. It's really cool. That's cool. And I just wanted to mention that because it is after nine. So I was going to, before we started wrapping up, I wanted yes. to make sure I mentioned that. Yeah, this is not too much. Uh, uh, Black Lotus source code is out there. There was some kind of questioning whether it's really the Black Lotus source code or not. Um, get in there, grab it, clone it like I did. See what who, knows, who knows when it's going to go away uh, kind of thing. Soon. So if you want it, you better get it. Yeah, go get it. There's a link to the GitHub to download the Black. <laughs> if it's even still there. Is it still there? I got I got it last week, but I I didn't know. <clears throat> it is still there. Yep. Well, it won't be forever. So if you want it, be, be sure you get it. Go get. I mean, it's out there now. So, like I have it. So if it goes away, you can get it from Paul. Don't, but don't do this. Just at get home. it from me. I'll just put it on my website. It's fine. There you go. <laughs> What's the worst that could happen? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. A couple of season just this. <clears throat> so so I haven't looked at it yet. Though. just I just before the show I I realized it was there and so I I added it in there. Uh, as well as a Twitter conversation from VX Underground uh, talking about it, where some people are like, is that really the Black Lotus source code? Is it not? Is it some derivative? I haven't looked at it, and I've not talked to experts in this area that um, ha- have looked at it yet because it just dropped. But uh, experts I know were like, hey, check this out. So more to follow on that, hopefully. Stackrock was uh, CVE 2023 3269 Linux privilege escalation vulnerability. This one's really deep in the memory management subsystem in Linux. Uh, all kernel configurations and requires minimal capabilities to trigger. However, it should be noted that Maple nodes. Are you familiar with Maple nodes? No. I wasn't either. It's something described in this related to the way the kernel does memory management. Um, so it says it should be noted that Maple nodes are freed using RCU callbacks, delaying the actual memory deallocation until after the RCU grace period. Is that some kind of like similar to like a use after free kind of protection kind of I would, thing? I would think so. Delaying, so I'm just delaying guessing, memory de- de- so delaying the actual memory deallocation. Uh-huh until after the RCU grace period. So somehow locking that so memory they've got to for, stall yep. before they unhook it because it might still be shutting down. So they're putting a bit of a stall in a there. Stall on it. So it says, consequently, exploiting this vulnerability is considered challenging. Um, they do say the complete exploit code and a comprehensive write-up will be made publicly available no later than the end of July. So they haven't fully released it yet. They're given the Linux kernel community uh, time to patch that. So I'm kind of questioning how exploitable i don't think we'll truly know how exploitable this is until they we get the exploit it. code and, and all that stuff and people start testing it so mm-hmm. more fortinet stuff i i just yeah probably for my day job i'll be writing more about the fortinet uh stuff and not a knock against fortinet in any way there's just been they had vulnerabilities they fixed vulnerabilities there was a whole strain of them and it's it's kind of hard to keep them uh straight I, it's not for, Fortinet is actually very forthcoming with all the yeah. information around them, but I think for many of us trying to figure out like what was the vulnerability, and then that vulnerability was in this product and was exploited by you know this group kind of thing. It's kind of hard to keep the mapping as we kind of alluded to uh, last week as well. Uh, Stealthy rootkit loader. Did we talk about that one? My story number five. Mm-hmm. 
this kind of goes along with my uh, high level of privilege, stealth, and impact uh, uh, kind of uh, train of thinking. So malicious actors who are actively seeking high privilege access to Windows operating systems use techniques that attempt to combat the increased protection that endpoint protection platforms and EDR technologies provide. Because these added layers of protection, attackers tend to opt for the path of least resistance to get their malicious code running at the kernel level or even lower levels. And this is why we believe threats will not disappear by threat actor toolkits anytime soon. This was a trend micro that was talking about um, specific malware. And <clears throat> I think of a different way to get uh, higher level kernel level code running different from the certificate kind of date uh, shenanigan thing we talked about uh, previously. So this was also a good, uh, a good write up as well. And also I think an indication of how or why attackers are going after a low level attacking at the kernel, which we've seen to gain that higher level of privilege, but also permeating before the kernel going into bootloaders, we talked about black Lotus going into firmware. There's been a lot of boot kits, there's a whole firmware attack timeline uh, that uh, I put together on Eclipsium site. So attacking the firmware all in, I've seen evidence supporting my theory that attackers are permeating to the lower levels of your system to get around protections because the protections are getting better. Yep. It's yep. getting to be a pain in the butt to get around some of the malware protection, even Windows Defender. So they're permeating lower, going into firmware level, going into kernel level. Yep. And they have to they have mm. a choice. So that's good. I mean, the further you push them down, it, the harder it gets. It's good, but bad in a way that I think we're ill-equipped. <laughs> yeah, but it's to... also exposing all that crap. So it, it's good that, you know, we all, you know, we started off focusing on the highest level, easiest crap. And now right. we're slowly digging down to like, you know, really low ring level type stuff that most people have trouble following. And... Yeah, that doesn't make it any better, but it, it definitely means that we're starting to get to the heart of it and it will improve things, I think. Oh, let's see if we missed anything. <clears throat> I'm good. This is photography, memory. I need a better way to track like what we've talked about on the show. <laughs> I've made this request. Uh, it's top five. We talked about even Jump Cloud and Cisco. Yeah. I think we're good. I think we're cool. Good. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for listening and watching this edition of Paul's Security Weekly. That will conclude this episode. Over and out.